Good morning and welcome to our spring webinar series, Finding True North in the Midst of Change, Veteran Transition and Moral Injury. Today's session in part three of our series will be a focus on drone violence and moral injury. I'm Eileen Schell, a professor of writing and rhetoric at Syracuse University, and I'm coordinator and co-founder of the Moral Injury Project. It will be my honor in a moment to introduce our guest presenters today, Dr. Christian Annamark and Dr. Lindsay Clark of the University of Southampton in the United Kingdom. But first, I'd like to begin with a land acknowledgement and thanks to our sponsors. I would like to acknowledge with respect the Onondaga Nation, Firekeepers of the Haudenosaunee, the indigenous peoples on whose ancestral lands Syracuse University now stands. And for thank yous, this event would not have been possible without the support of so many people. First, Dr. Brian Conkle, the Dean of Hendricks Chapel, and the staff members of the chapel who supported this event in so many different ways. Delaney Vanway, Peg Northrup, Alex Snow, and also intern Christina Cole. Many thanks to our ASL interpreter and captioner who are making this an accessible event. And also a big thanks to the European Research Council who funded the Drone Ethics Project and the research you will hear today. I also wanna thank the Moral Injury Project Steering Committee, Susan French of the Montessori School, and our two steering committee members who will serve as moderators today. Jennifer Reddy, Veteran Services Coordinator and Associate Director of Continuing Education at Lemoyne College, and Jen Jeffrey, an academic librarian at SUNY Plattsburgh and a US Coast Guard veteran. Today's session will focus, as I said earlier, on drone violence and moral injury. And the title of the session is Wielding Drone Violence and Risking Moral Injury. Our webinar leaders are Dr. Dr. Christian Annamark and Dr. Lindsay Clark of the University of Southampton in the United Kingdom. Dr. Christian Annamark is Professor of International Relations in the School of Economics, Social and Political Sciences and the European Research Council Principal Investigator for the Drone Ethics Project. Dr. Annamark is the author of three books, including Armed Drones and the Ethics of War, Military Virtue in a Post-Heroic Age. And he also recently edited the volume, Ethics of Drone Strikes, Restraining Remote Control Killing. His current book project for Edinburgh University Press is Moralities of Violence in the Drone Age. Dr. Lindsay Clark is a European Research Council Research Fellow on the Drone Ethics Project in the School of Economic, Social, and Political Sciences at the University of Southampton. She's leading the project Drone Violence as Interpersonal Violence. She published the book Gender and Drone Warfare a hauntological approach with the Rutledge Gender and Security series. Her research focuses on the gender dimensions of new technologies of war. We're very pleased to have both researchers with us today. And after Dr. Enamark and Dr. Clark's remarks, there will be time for questions and responses from the audience via the chat function. So feel free to write your comments and questions there. Jen Reddy and Jennifer Jeffrey, who are our moderators, will bring those comments and questions forward to be addressed during the question and answer time. It's our honor, excuse me, to welcome Dr. Enamark and Dr. Clark. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Eileen, for that introduction. And I'll, I'll now share some slides with you all. So uh, Lindsay and I were really honored to be invited uh, to this event and we're very keen uh, to hear the people's comments and feedback and advice uh, following uh, the time we spend laying out some ideas for you. Um, we are political theorists uh, from a, a department of, of politics, uh, but we want to acknowledge straight away uh, that the, the study of moral injury is multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary. Uh, and although we come at this as political theorists, we're also fascinated by those who approach this topic either from a theological perspective uh, or a uh, clinical psychology perspective and various other perspectives uh, as, as well. Um, let me uh, move on to talk about, if you like, our, our drone ethics project in the big picture. 
I'll lay that out very briefly, and then I'll talk specifically about why, as a matter of moral theory, uh, there is a moral injury risk that attaches uh, to the wielding of uh, drone violence. Now, we are deliberately using the phrase drone violence rather than drone warfare, although drone warfare is a form of drone violence. We're wanting to use that word violence in, in, a, in a way that is general, so as to be able to contemplate different forms of violence and the different forms of moral reasoning that are traditionally or even possibly applied uh, to a particular concept of drone violence. Many of you, I'm told, um, especially in New York, living in the so-called drone corridor will be highly familiar with the political and public debate uh, about armed drones. Uh, the United States government has been the world's uh, most prolific and conspicuous user of armed drones. And here you see an image of a, of a so-called Reaper drone, um, also known within military circles as the MQ-9 drone system or uninhabited aerial vehicle system. Uh, the M in MQ-9 stands for multi-purpose uh, and among those purposes are uh, strike, the strike capacity. And there you see a Hellfire missile being released from the drone aircraft. And the drone is controlled from potentially thousands of miles away. And it's interesting because of that physical distance. It's interesting because of the weaponry that's attached. But most of all, uh, we argue, it's interesting because of that powerful video camera, as well as other sensors that you can see mounted in that instrument bowl uh, at the bottom of the fuselage there in the, in the bottom right uh, of, of the screen. Now, I said that we are pursuing a broader project and the Drone Ethics Project thinks about uh, drone violence in, in four ways. Uh, as I said, we can think ethically about drone violence by using a war concept. Uh, we can think about it in terms of violence being violent law enforcement, and there we can think about policing and punitive forms of violence. Uh, we can also think about uh, what I'm tentatively calling tele-intimate violence, uh, where the focus is not so much on institutional and state action, but the individual agency of people who are directly controlling the armed drone, and that's going to be our focus uh, today. Uh, and the fourth facet that we're looking into in the broader project is uh, violence that has been devolved, handed over, if you like, partly or fully to artificial intelligence. And all these four concepts of drone violence are overlapping in certain ways. There is an interplay between them. Uh, but, but for today, we're, we're focusing, as I say, on that, uh, that element of tele-intimate uh, violence, although I'd certainly welcome some feedback on this concept of, of tele-intimacy uh, as we go along. So there has been some uh, coverage uh, in the media and in the academic literature uh, of the experience of individual drone operators, by which I mean those two individuals seated side by side, one the pilot operating the aircraft itself and responsible for releasing a weapon, and next to that pilot, the sensor operator uh, who is responsible for targeting and, and, and tracking the targeting and maintaining uh, uh, focus on that uh, target. And I think straight away, it's important to acknowledge that in terms of the empirical picture, as I say, we're political theorists, but we're engaged also in a degree of empirical research. In terms of the empirical picture, this is a very hard topic to research. It's hard to get at the phenomenon of individual agency in the wielding of drone violence for, for a number of reasons, partly because there are very strict research ethics protocols that we must adhere to. And of course, we, we adhere to those willingly and it's important that we do that, um, given the sensitivity uh, of, of the subject matter. It can be difficult gaining access to especially serving drone operators. And from time to time, we've encountered and Lindsay has encountered a reluctance uh, on the part of uh, government representatives uh, to allow uh, research uh, of, of this kind uh, to go ahead in terms of human research, the interviewing of, of individuals with experience of operating an armed drone. Uh, and also as a methodological caveat, um, oftentimes to the extent that empirical research can be undertaken, uh, the, the individuals who do volunteer to participate are self-selecting. And so there's, there's a concern maybe that um, the empirical information that is derived is possibly not 
uh, representative representative uh, of, of what's going on out there uh, in, in the drone use uh, community. Now we come at this um, we come at this whole idea of telemetered violence, and we're fascinated by the the concept and utility of the concept of moral injury, precisely because as political theorists we find that mainstream moral theory just can't do enough of the heavy lifting to reason our way through why people feel a moral discomfort when it comes to the use of drones. Now, many of you who study ethical theory and war will be familiar with the principles of the just war. Uh, these have been around uh, for centuries, um, developed over the centuries by a series of old men, as you see on the, on, on the top. And it's uh, a form of, thinking ethically about war and political violence according to certain principles. And in large measure, this is very helpful. It has a restraining influence. It helps structure our moral thinking. And yet we have found that, and plenty of other scholars have found as well along the way, that for some participants in war, including combatants, warriors, it's just not enough to think only in these terms, that, that there's a there's a degree of personal morality that's missing from this just war uh, tradition. Now, the tradition itself translates into international law of armed conflict. Here's an example of, uh, of how the principle of discrimination, for example, translates directly into a piece of international humanitarian law. And we can talk about being ethical in the sense of following the law and following rules and being faithful to the letter of the law. And we can say, well, there are principles that manifest in international law. If we're following international law, we are being ethical. And that's the beginning and the end of the story. We're not so convinced of that um, because there is more to ethics than rules. There's more to morality than rule following and rule violation. And for a start, for example, the rules themselves uh, might be morally problematic, in which case rule following may be uh, something that is not morally uh, desirable. But if we then find ourselves dissatisfied with the completeness of just war thinking, and we search around for other ways in which we can engage our moral thinking in a way that is meaningful and relevant and potentially helpful to individuals who struggle to use just war theory to explain away that which is morally troublesome about war, we can turn perhaps to this fascinating and useful and politically challenging concept of moral injury. This resonates, we find very strongly with um, a, a, a pre-existing alternative to, to just war uh, theorizing, which is, which is virtue ethics dating back to the time of Aristotle. And virtue ethics, of course, is, is primarily concerned not so much with rules and rule following, but with, with character and positive traits and individual moral agency. Individual moral agency, we find, is particularly important and applicable here. And so there, I've emphasised in, in one of the many definitions that are out there, thinking about right and wrong at the level of personal goodness. And by talking about moral agency, we can open up a conversation about individual moral agency as an alternative to, or as an addition to institutional moral agency. We can play a role as we use force on behalf of the state, and we can say that we are performing an institutional role, but there's also an individual role and an individual identity that we've never lost, even though we assume an institutional role. Now, I'm originally from Australia. I've been um, working in the UK for nearly eight years now, but I, I made a visit back to Australia a couple of years ago. And in my hometown of Sydney, I came across a remarkable new uh, work of, of public art. Uh, it was a piece um, designed and installed by uh, an Indigenous Australian gentleman by the name of Tony Albert. Uh, and it's a, it was controversial and remains controversial. Um, it is a, a commemoration of Australian Indigenous and Torres Strait Islander uh, men and women who, who served in the Australian Defence Forces in the First and Second World Wars. And the artist here is representing the warrior, not in the traditional Western fashion that, that we're all accustomed to, the, the clean-limbed individual stuck up on a pedestal. The, indivi the, the individual warrior here, or, or seven individual warriors here in the artist's rendition, are represented 
as bullets. And it's a work of art that captures very well, I think, the, the idea that soldiers are not just sent to die for their country, they're sent to kill for their country. And when you see that three out of the seven bullets here have fallen, we can think about this idea that the soldier can be thought about as a perpetrator of violence, as a victim of violence, and maybe they can be thought about as a, a perpetrator and victim all at once. Because when, when being sent to war, both dying and killing are fearsome prospects. And we, we fear, we morally fear the killing, just as we physically fear uh, the dying. So what about the drone operators? Here's an image, and I've deliberately chosen one where the faces are not towards us. There is this imagination of the drone operator, the military drone operator, faceless and unseen. Um, the drone operator could be uh, operating an aircraft over a, a zone of armed conflict, such as been in the case in Afghanistan, in Iraq or Libya. The drone operator could be operating an aircraft in a zone where, there are, where the drone using state is not involved in armed conflict, for example, in the, uh, in the northwest of Pakistan or in, in Yemen or in Somalia uh, in the past. Um, and Lindsay and I are interested in whether what you see here can be a place where a kind of injustice happens, an injustice in the form of moral injury potentially incurred by the operator of the armed drone uh, who, who remotely uh, kills. We make no claim, of course, that any injustice that occurs right there is in any way more important or more worth talking about than the many other kinds of injustice associated with the use of drone violence. But we do make the claim that it is interesting uh, to look into this uh, per se. So you'll see all the screens and maps and it's all extremely high tech. And there's, there's a stereotype of the drone operator, which is, it's just a geek. It's, uh, it's like playing a computer game. They don't know what they're doing. They're disengaged. Um, this is push button war. This is a, a now, I think now a quite dated view. It's becoming more and more clear that individual drone operators take extremely seriously uh, their work and oftentimes really are deeply morally engaged in what they're doing, which involves watching, which involves sometimes killing, but not just, if you like, the killing of so-called bad guys, but at times also the protection of so-called good guys. Uh, armed drones are used not only for targeted killings, which is what the media often writes about, but also for, to provide close air support uh, to friendly ground troops. So at the level of moral theory then, how might we think about why the wielding of drone violence carries a risk uh, of, of moral uh, injury? Well, I like to structure this um, along three lines. And the first of these is I say that, well, part of the reason uh, why there's a risk of moral injury, because there is a great tradition, at least in, in, in the military sphere, uh, of availing oneself of moral permission to kill precisely because one is putting oneself at risk. That there is a relationship, if you like, between the circumstance of being at risk and, if you like, the moral permission to put others at risk violently. Now, in circumstances where a drone operator is thousands of miles away from the person being targeted uh, by a, a drone launch missile, self-defense doesn't enter into it. So it might immediately be a struggle to, to reach for the same kinds of justifications that, for example, an infantryman uh, might reach for, or for that matter, uh, the pilot of a manned aircraft who is nevertheless up in the air in a dangerous situation. But it perhaps doesn't have to be only self-defense or one's own self at risk. For example, it may be that we can think about mutual risk in terms of the drone oper operator feeling like a proxy for the risk that really is being experienced by uh, a friendly soldier on the ground for whom that drone operator is providing a close air support. Now there perhaps there might be more available uh, concept of risk, which is then able to be translated in the minds of a drone operator to a kind of moral permission to go ahead and use force. 
But this might be less the case in circumstances where there isn't a soldier on the ground in immediate need of protection. There is no other defense imperative as a matter of urgency. For example, in the case of a targeted killing. And in a targeted killing, it then might be harder to find that sense of moral permission that comes from mutual risk. The second way I like to think about this is the way in which the drone operator is constantly back and forth between home and work and so much more than that. Because work is a world of violence. That The actual world of violence is thousands of miles away, but the control of violence is at work. But to go home is to return to an exquisite world of peace. And plenty of authors have written in the past about the difficulties that many military veterans have encountered with reintegrating into civilian society where there are these much different expectations, especially as regards the permissibility of violence against other human beings, that it is perhaps a struggle to be constantly back and forth, reminded every time you return to that civilian world of peace that it is ordinarily bad, it is ordinarily not permitted to kill. That constant reminder perhaps creates a pressure arguably, that, that constant reminder of the wrongness of killing, the ordinary wrongness of killing, even though it may be permitted in a war context, that constant reminder nevertheless creates pressure toward uh, a risk of moral injury in the sense of a drone operator adversely, judge, adversely judging uh, their own conduct and being becoming victim of a debilitating sense of having done wrong. And the third way I like to think about this is the concept of tele-intimacy. And here again, the camera is all important. There is moral significance, not just in the killing of another human being, but we argue also in the prolonged observation of that human being prior to a killing. Because so much of the way in which killing has been done in a military way over the last several decades has been about taking it out of sight, killing at a distance, uh, long range warfare. But the camera brings things right back close again. An abrupt reversal of that trend to put it all out of sight. And that watching is something that we think really needs to be inquired into. And so the third element, and I'll finish on this, which is the camera enables a witnessing of the prosaic humanity of the person being targeted for a drone strike. Now, the photos you're seeing here are obviously not drone camera photographs, but they're photos taken from the trenches of the First World War by wartime, wartime photographers who were showing soldiers not as soldiers, if you like. Soldiers doing regular old things, these prosaic acts of, of washing a dog or, or having a shave, soldiers not in their threatening mode and persona, if you like. And those soldiers arguably are harder to kill because they're harder to regard as threatening. That prosaic humanity is revealed to us through the camera and it's reflected upon us because we recognize ourselves in the human beings that are observed uh, doing these ordinary things uh, in this way. And that exquisite orderliness, again, is tougher to extinguish. And it is more difficult, arguably, to kill in circumstances where so much of a person's humanity has been revealed to you by that uh, powerful camera. And to go ahead despite that uh, to kill, having so closely observed someone before that, uh, we suggest uh, increases the risk of moral injury and a, and a conviction of, of having done wrong. I'd like to finish off, if I may, um, <clears throat> with a slide that doesn't show you a, um, a, an image or e even a video from a drone camera, but it's a, it's a written description of um, what is seen by a British uh, armed drone operator. And uh, it's a slide uh, with some text on it. And rather than read out the text, uh, I'm going to just let you uh, read it through for yourselves. And so I think it's better that I do that. So I'm gonna move to that slide now. And, just by way of introduction, again, I'm wanting to underline this point about prosaic humanity. So I'll let you, I'm about to go silent, but do please take time to read this slide for yourselves.
Okay, I'm gonna stop there now and now give way to my colleague, Lindsay. Thank you, Christian. I'm just gonna bring up a couple of slides myself. Okay, hopefully you can all, all see those. So thank you for that, Christian. And thank you, Eileen, uh, for the opportunity to have this discussion with you all. Um, I'm really interested, as Christian said, to hear your feedback on, on the things that we've been working on. I'm gonna reflect uh, during my part of this presentation on some of Christian's points um, to introduce a series of questions. Um, I think they're quite provocative and I think none of them have simple answers, but I hope that you will find them, them interesting and uh, pertinent to the discussion that we're having here today. So the presentation is written around the broad question of whether to be considered morally acceptable, war should hurt. Um, I want to argue that the concerns about killing from a distance are underpinned that by physical risk crews uh, make drone strikes inherently unethical. So it appears that to kill ethically in war, one must risk being physically harmed. And I think that this is problematic for two reasons. Um, firstly, it ignores the risk of emotional and psychological harm, which Christine has alluded to and which I'm going to unpack in a little more detail. And secondly, the debate has thus far neglected to interrogate why being hurt underpins arguments about whether conducting war is ethical or not. That should take me to the next slide, hopefully. Or not. Okay. So I think it's telling that the lack of risk to drone crews, which in part enables them to coolly and calmly collect the evidence required to carefully assess their targets, is something that many find ethically troubling. It has been centuries since war has comprised of pitched battles between semi-matched opponents. And indeed, I think many of us would argue that the aim in war has always been to create asymmetry in your favor. But with the increasing reliance on technology in war, and particularly the use of drones, we have moved from a point of a measure of asymmetry to something which Rennick argues we can consider as radical asymmetry. And for some people, this is then an ethical concern. This has important implications because the legality and morality of, war, of for, the use of force in warfare is built on the assumption of mutual risk of A, the combatants, and B, the belligerents as parties. So what is pertinent for this presentation is not so much whether or to what extent the crews are at risk of physical injury or death, or even if the enemy, broadly conceived, can defend themselves, but whether a lack of risk constitutes a moral problem. What has been lacking in the discussion thus far is an acknowledgement that injury and hurt do not always have to be physical, and that is something that obviously pertains to the question and discussion here today. Next slide. So military training, in part, uh, aims to reduce the likelihood that troops will be injured during war. This includes the likelihood of psychological injury. As Dobos notes, one of combat training aims is to enable recruits to use lethal violence without suffering emotional distress. My question, then, is whether by reducing the likelihood of psychological injury, military training is increasing the likelihood of moral injury. Is military training a form of psychological strengthening or a process of dehumanization? Is it a form of resilience or is it in fact a form of hurt? For example, committing atrocities in war is enabled in part by the dehumanization of the enemy and therefore this dehumanization is ethically questionable. But when we try to avoid dehumanization, people are more likely to get psychologically hurt by their experiences of war demonstrating that there is a significant tension between what is considered ethically right, what is strategically effective, and how we can best protect our armed forces. If, as Aristotle claims, courage is rightly praised because it includes the presence of pain, can this include psychological pain? And do the efforts to reduce psychological pain reduce the crew's abilities to act courageously or indeed ethically? We would expect a morally healthy person who has to kill another human to find this in some measure distressing, even if that killing is legally and ethically justified. Where attention has been paid to psychological implications of drone warfare, there has been a shift in narrative, as Christian has noted, from when drone violence was relatively new to now after nearly 15 years. So the initial concerns 
were that mediating the view of targets through screens would shield the crews from the reality of their actions. Human beings would become little more than blips on the screen, binary code flying along cables from, from satellites. Through digitalization, drone operators were at risk of forgetting or disassociating from the real human beings receive, at the receiving end of the strikes, their embodied reality, their pain and the impact of their deaths. And this has been referred to as PlayStation mentality. Indeed, there were some reports that drone crew viewed drones, excuse me, there were some reports that drone crews viewed killing as akin to squashing an ant, and the use of the phrase bug splat suggests an imperially a severely impaired sense of morality or even moral degradation. As a result, there has been much debate largely unresolved on whether killing by remote control is difficult or easy or too easy. Since those early articles on PlayStation mentality, there have been anecdotal pieces and some more systematic research, which indicates that drone crews can and do suffer emotional trauma as a result of their crewing experiences. And this is something that obviously um, many of you will have come across, and particularly if you've read the piece about Brandon Bryant or come across much of his testimony. This testimony, albeit sometimes perhaps sensationalized, has indicated, has strongly, ind has indicated strongly that the PlayStation mentality is contradicted uh, as our claims of emotional distance. This shift in understanding drone crew experience, however, does not tell us whether experiencing this distress makes the individual's actions or inaction in the event more or less morally good. And that's something that I'm quite interested in. So in the context of drone warfare, what emerges from the interview data with former and current crew members is three ways in which their roles can be traumatic. Firstly, through the seeing of traumatic events, such as seeing IS overrun um, an Iraqi army camp. Secondly, through the killing, accidental or otherwise, of civilians. And thirdly, through the killing of the intended targets. In the latter of these, at least, some of the trauma occurs from what we have referred to as the prosaic humanity or humanity revealed. And as Christian has already stated, this is partly results from the extensive surveillance conducted by the drone crews. Here, the crews feel they have come to know the individual target and acknowledge his or her status as a human being with a somewhat similar mundane life to themselves. And this association makes the process of killing more psychologically difficult. So then, if we know that conducting drone strikes can cause psychological hurt, it is then necessary to return to my primary question of should war hurt? And when I ask, should drone war hurt? I'm really asking whether pain, either physical or psychological, experienced by the individual conducting a lethal strike makes their actions more ethically acceptable than if they felt no pain. Discussing a strike which killed civilians, one individual noted, I definitely felt guilty. You have to go through a period of feeling bad about what has happened, of feeling bad about yourself. What is not clear is whether the rationale for this feeling bad is because being a human being means being hurt by something like this, or because you have to feel bad about something like this in order to ensure that your actions are morally good. Therefore, I think it's necessary to consider what is the ethical point of hurt. The aim of moralizing about war, I would argue, is to mitigate its worst excesses, to make war better. But I'm wary of this too, because that then begs the question, better for whom? Those inflicting death and destruction, the victims or the targets or the enemies on the ground, the militaries or the employers and the politicians directing the war all should have a say. And I think there are lots of different viewpoints here. And beyond that, again, what do we mean by better? After all, if you die, you die regardless of how you are killed. So if we follow the logics of just war theory, better drone warfare could result in fewer or zero civilian casualties, less damage to the environment in targeted regions, less damage to livelihoods and infrastructures, and strategic effectiveness resulting in the significant decrease or eradication of the threat which warranted the strike in the first place. These better kinds of strikes would, presumably, also reduce the amount of hurt experienced by the operators. Being secure in the knowledge that they have struck and killed only bad guys, narrowly defined, having a clear and therefore justified positive impact on the overarching strategic aims of the campaign, and having caused such minimal damage as to avoid blowback from the local population or really causing any harm to the same, 
All of these things would surely make it easier for the crews to do their job, including conducting lethal strikes. If we follow this logic, then the friction created by the fog of war, its insecurities and uncertainties, would be absent in drone campaigns. In this scenario, as impossible as it is, would we still feel uncomfortable about drone violence? Would the absence of some measure of hurt, psychological as well as physical, to the crews raise the spectre of unethical action or immorality in war? Are we, in this fictionalised war space, back in the realm of the PlayStation war and emotional disengagement? Given that the above scenario is an impossibility, where in the sliding scale between no hurt and complete accuracy and unbearable psychological distress and no discrimination is the most ethical position? Certainly the hurt felt by drone operators and crews is a challenge to the argument that drone warfare or drone violence is too easy. Although this doesn't address the argument that it could still be too easy for states to sanction this kind of violence, even if it does hurt the operators and even if it does make it harder to recruit and retain staff. Does psychological wellness make for a better, more ethical, more caring killer? Or does it make for greater distancing and dehumanization? Therefore, given that drone crews can and are hurt by the experiences, what can and should we do? Addressing concerns about the impact on mental health of drone missions, drone crews in the UK, UK and US militaries have increased access to some various support mechanisms. Crews have access to chaplains, peer-to-peer -peer support groups, debriefing sessions, psychologists, and even marriage counsellors. All, all these mechanisms aim to mitigate the hurt, build emotional resilience, and support the mental health of drone crews. So where does this lead us in terms of thinking about how ethical drone strikes can be? If some individuals are better able to handle what one of my, indivi my interviewees delightfully referred to as the crunchy bits, does that mean that they are conducting warfare more unethically than those who may be finding some of the sites and experiences more psychologically troubling? The point of these provocations is to raise the question of whether war to be considered ethical should hurt, and if our conceptualization of hurt can and should include psychological pain. Critiques of drone warfare have often referred to issues of unfairness, of crews being emotionally detached and therefore capable of thoughtless killing. Where evidence has suggested that drone crews can be hurt by their experiences, the question has remained whether their experience of this hurt is somehow morally appropriate. When Brandon Bryant, whose photo you saw in Christian's um, presentation, said to his mother, I killed people and I don't feel good about it. Her response was, good, that's how it should feel. You should never not feel that way. The ethical imperative there is clearly that having killed, the killer should be hurt. Given that, I want to close with some more questions, which I don't have answers to. Should we be reassured that drone war hurts? Is this evidence of moral and ethical goodness? And if so, and should we, if at all, address it? And I think I'm going to finish there and I really look forward to hearing your questions. Thank you. All right, thank you to Lindsay and thank you to Christian. I'm going to open it up for comments and questions. Um, Jen Jeffrey and Jen Reddy will be bringing those questions forward. Also, if you have comments, we will relay those comments to the whole group. So please feel free to write in the chat and we'll bring forward comments and questions. And thank so, you so much to our presenters. So far we have uh, one comment and one question. So I'll read the comment first and then ask the question. Um, this is from Anthony Beasley. As a veteran, I can tell you unless one is a psychopath or has had a major break in psychology, Killing anyone is difficult. However, moral injury comes to those that drop bombs, fire artillery, or load bombs on the planes. The object of war is to win from the military um, view. And then we had a question from uh, Jack Gilroy. Um, have you studied possible moral injury of those who ordered drone killings? Do you suspect people like George Bush, Barack Obama, and now the new president of the United States have experienced moral injury. <laughs> Omit Mr. Trump for he is well understood to be amoral.
So comment, question, or excuse me, a question to either Christian or Lindsay or both. Right, uh, well, I'll have a go. And um, first of all, thank you uh, to Anthony for his uh, uh, comment, um, uh, which, which is very insightful. Uh, in, in response to, to, the, to the question, uh, no, we have not inquired into uh, moral injury incurred through the ordering uh, of uh, drone strikes. That would indeed be fascinating. That, <clears throat> it, it would immediately open up, of course, um, a number of different requirements from a research ethics perspective and could be even more challenging um, in terms of acquiring uh, some empirical data on the experience of people who have issued uh, uh, those orders. So just by way of an answer, I'm going to just say that, no, we haven't, but it's an interesting idea and I will uh, give it some thoughts. So thank you. I want to add too that Eric Liddick, who has, uh, who was in the military has uh, posted to me and I posted to the whole group that's here in this um, session, an article about his experiences as legal counsel weighing in on drone strikes. So I think Eric's perspective as a service member um, and someone who had to make a legal decision about a drone strike could be a really enlightening perspective in response to that question. So I put that link in the chat and Eric is on the call too, and maybe he will type in the chat or be willing to share further. But I thought that what he had to say there was really relevant to that question. May I just briefly comment, if I may, that uh, I, I shared Eric's um, piece with a number of colleagues shortly after it came out, and Lindsay and I both read it prior to this. And it, it's, it's interesting and, and valuable, not only for its, for its content, but for me, it was interesting and important that, that a lawyer wrote this, because I, I think it, it very well underpins the notion that there is more to ethics than rules and rule following. So it's important to me that a lawyer wrote this and, and wrote it so well. Yes, thank you. And so um, Lindsay, I don't know if you wanted to weigh in or, or if Jen should bring another question or comment forward. I think Christian's probably covered that just fine. So I'm happy to wait for the next question. Okay, thank you. Jen? At, at the moment, we don't have any questions at the moment, so yeah. Um, I wanted to ask a question specifically given Lindsay's research interests in gender and drone strikes and uh, drone warfare. Um, I'm curious, I know you weren't covering that necessarily in this session, but I am interested in that as someone who works directly with, a, with um, both men and women who have served in the military and um, the kind of uh, moral injury that comes from uh, experiences in gendered bodies, especially for women veterans, I'm thinking about. But um, I'd be curious just to hear what your research has found. And um, I, I realize you have a book on the subject, but I'd like to give you an opportunity just to say a little bit about that work in addition to the presentation topics we're addressing today. Thanks, Eileen. Yeah, it's um, it's been an interesting one, and it's one that I've kind of looked at um, from two perspectives. So the book deals with um, how conducting drone warfare challenges traditional conceptions of military masculinity. So how we have historically and culturally understood what it means to be a good soldier um, and how that has traditionally been coded as masculine, sort of the rational um, and the sort of erosion and the sort of repression of anything emotional. Um, so I was quite interested to see how that played out in distance from warfare and how representations of drone warriors or drone crews as um, childlike or like the cartoon that um, Christian posted, someone playing a computer game, how that mitigated the idea that these individuals were as valued members, serving members of the military as um, individuals who might serve in other different roles um, that don't involve so much distance. So that was sort of the first line that I had a look at. And then I've just recently published a piece um, looking at um, how female drone operators are constructed in pop culture representations. So a slightly different look, but I looked at a play 
by George Brandt called Grounded, which some of you might have seen a uh, one woman play. And I compared that with some interview data from a female drone operator. And I looked at how um, both of these individuals were pregnant as, as drone operators and they both had their children and how that sort of narrative about parenthood played out in their experiences of trauma and moral injury. And I think one of my concerns is that women's um, experiences of moral injury tends to be attributed to personal things. So instead of saying they had a, an ethical issue with war, the, the war that they were fighting or with some of the um, specific operations that they were involved with, even if they claim those things, people tend to assume that women are upset about struggling with parenthood whilst conducting these operations or with um, emotional irrationality that comes from pregnancy hormones. So it's been quite an interesting but quite a diverse range of, of ways of looking at it. There is of course another gendered angle which I haven't personally looked at but has there's been some really good work done on looking at the targeting of military age males and how that how obviously is, is heavily gendered and how women are always coded as civilians if they're targeted or struck and how men aren't necessarily uh, and, and what implications that have. And I mean, I think the implications there are huge, they're, they're life and death. Um, so yeah, there's some really important work that gender is doing in this space. Thank you. And um, there's also a comment from Eric that that skewed perspective of masculinity bleeds into the norms of masculinity that perpetuates the stigmas that prevent us from getting at PTS and moral injury. So I thought I would throw that in there. And I know Jen has some other questions that have stacked up in the, the chat that mm -hmm. she'll be bringing forward. So thank you, Lindsay. So we have one person has two questions and what is the one, the first one is what is the practical application of your research? And, ha and the second is, have you studied the trauma experienced by victims of drone attacks who number in the tens of thousands? Um, I'll, I'll have a go at that. Um, but both good questions. On, on practical application, um, I think mean, when you set up the risk of moral injury as, as another of the reasons to be morally concerned about drone violence and another of the uh, bases for restraining it, um, you, you potentially um, set up the practical effect of reducing the scope for using armed drones, by which I mean reducing the, the range of circumstances in which it is um, uh, morally uh, permissible. And I, I have in mind in particular the distinction I mentioned earlier between drone use that involves close air support of friendly ground troops who are immediately at risk and drone use, which is the targeted killing of a long observed suspected terrorist out there in the in the middle of the, the desert or, or, or a mountain range. And at the level of theory, at least, I, I'm suggesting that the, there is a greater risk of moral injury that attaches to the latter, to the targeted killing uh, scenario, because um, there isn't that same kind of other defense imperative as, as there is on close air support. And I think it, it, once you start getting into that there's potential to open up a new way of conducting drone strikes that involves empowering drone operators to exercise more discretion than is currently the case. Now, it's, it's, it's hard to know exactly how these things play out. Uh, are orders issued? Is a strike merely authorized? How much pressure is there to act as authorized? How much discretion not to act as authorized is retained? These are interesting, and some colleagues uh, of mine at other universities have suggested, for example, that the empowered drone operator uh, would be perhaps more akin to a British police constable who has that discretion as to whether or not to use force, that kind of original authority, uh, and that the, the UK police constable traditionally cannot be ordered uh, to, to, to shoot to kill, uh, for example. That there's been a suggestion that that could also be the case for uh, individual drone operators. Whether or not that would be at all compatible with the military way of doing things in terms of command responsibility and the like would, would need to be got into. The, the, the second question is, is, is very good and just briefly, no, we haven't, but not because we don't care, but rather because a great deal of good work has been done in this space. And 
we, we, may, we make no claim at all that what we are inquiring into is more worthy of inquiry. And we make no claim that the injustice we're interested in is a graver injustice than uh, the injustice that this questioner uh, talks about, which is the thousands of people who died uh, in drone strikes. Um, that latter concern is important. It may well be, in the grand scheme of things, more important, and it remains important to keep inquiring into it. So thank you for raising that point. If I could just add a tiny little bit to the, the end of that point there, um, anyone interested in the sort of experiences of the other side of the coin um, should look at the work of um, Alex Edney Brown. She's done some really good empirical work uh, on that side, and I think she'd be well worth looking at. And Lindsay, could you type that into the chat? So for people that are wanting to follow up on this, I know we have a number of veterans and psychologists, counselors, um, people working on these issues on a number of fronts who would be very interested in following up with that. So thank you to both of you. And I think Jen has, we have quite a few other questions. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, how might this research be related to the public more broadly to affect public understanding of drone warfare, ethics and morality? Uh, the person is asking because drone warfare has been construed as boring, not spectacular in the sense of the shock and awe campaign in Iraq, for example, and as hidden from public view, as you've noted. That, that's another excellent question. And I think there is a deficit of public understanding on this issue, which unfortunately is, is just a, a further iteration of of, of a profound um, disengagement and misunderstanding uh, of the military life and the military profession by most civilians, which, which is a kind of a broader concern. Um, the civilian response to the veteran is to just hero worship. Uh, the civilian notion of what it means to come back from an experience of war is the erecting of a statue or uh, a parade in the streets. It's flag waving, it's, it's thank you for your service. And, and for most civilians, that's the extent of their imagining of, of, of what this all means. And there's a, there's a deep problem about how unfamiliar um, most civilians are with what goes on and, and a deep problem in the relative lack of opportunity uh, that veterans have uh, to, to explain the things um, that they've seen and done in service uh, uh, to, to their country um, in, in a way that would bridge the divide and, and, and bridge that gap in understanding. The last thing I would say about um, this issue of public understanding and awareness of drone, um, drone strikes, however, is that it seems that there's largely no real ongoing awareness that it is happening. And it has been going on for a very long time. And precisely because drone operators are never turning up in flag draped coffins, there isn't this exquisite sense of people putting themselves on the line in the way that they would be for soldiers deployed uh, uh, overseas. Um, and I think there's possibly a disturbing disconnect and a possible democratic deficit uh, when drone violence is going on for years on end in circumstances where the public is largely unaware and therefore is not really engaging with the issue and, and constantly updating its approval of it or possibly deciding to withdraw its approval of it either through congressional representatives or other democratic means. I'll leave it there for now. If I and could... Uh yeah, just add very briefly on the sort of practical application. Um, I think one of the core things we're trying to do, especially with the work that I've been doing, trying to, to interview uh, former and currently serving uh, crew members, is to make sure that there is more representative, more empirical data, because I think part of the practical application is, is for the public to understand what is going on, it, both in the way that Christian has spoken about, but also in terms of the experience of that and how that is the same or different from other experiences that individuals might have. I think we have a risk of having just a couple of 
big well-known pieces of data um, that have been published in the newspapers or whatever that don't necessarily provide us with the full scope of, of what we need to understand and I think that's particularly important when we look at the difference between maybe British and American um, reaper crew experiences, or now that more countries are, are sort of being able to use and deploy those technologies, how national experience might might change, um, yeah, change some of the findings that we have. Thanks. And we have another question that's connected to that. Um, how does Robert J. Lifton's concept of psychic numbing play into this? both for warriors and order givers, but for all of us in society. That's a good question, but I'm afraid I, I don't know about um, Robert J. Lifton's concept of psychic numbing. So I would have to see if, if Christian knows much about that. I, I am familiar with it, but I couldn't explain it or tell you why it's useful for our project. It's a good question and I'd love to know what the person who asked it uh, imagines it, it, it might bring to the conversation. All right. Um, well, we'll encourage that questioner to follow up with that. It is a good question. And so we have a, a comment and also a question at the end. It seems like in order to engage in this discourse, one has to accept the very premise that war is going to happen. So. No longer is the central question one of how to de-weaponize or evolve away from a system of international warfare, but instead a question of how war should be ethically fought. I wonder about how you both feel about the cost of giving up that kind of ground in the discourse, or is that an ethic that you explicitly come back around to in your writing? Really good, very important. Um, Yes, I mean, we've, we've kind of been concentrating on that kind of in the moment, you know, the, the conduct of the strike. Is it right? Is it wrong? How does it feel? Does it feel right? Does it feel wrong? And that question about how we should conduct violence arguably cannot be divorced from the question of why we are doing it. Um, I think this relates to this idea of whether or not war should be going on at all. Um, and the literature in military ethics on conscientious objection and selective conscientious objection speaks very strongly to this very idea um, that the, 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 the ethically aware thinking uh, military professional will, yes, try to be excellent in the conduct of war, but, but will not close their mind or eyes to, to the broader uh, political uh, uh, questions. Um, there is a temptation when considering the rights and wrongs of the conduct of war and other violence, yes, to, to lose sight of whether or not it should be going on uh, at all. And one of the arguments that's often trotted out in favor of drone use is that it is so much safer to use armed drones than it is to say deploy special forces. And the argument is, well, um, if we can achieve the same effect by using a drone rather than sending in some soldiers who can get shot at and, and bleed to death, if we can achieve the same uh, effect, then we have a moral duty to use the drone instead. But of course, that presupposes that there was, it was going to be one or the other anyway. That if the drone wasn't available, there was going to be a deployment of soldiers. But if, if, if that was never going to be the case, and it was the choice between send in a drone or do nothing, that is, don't wage war at all, don't perpetrate violence at all, um, then that, that comparative advantage and that, that argument of of the moral imperative of sparing soldiers' lives is not available. So this speaks to this issue that the question is right to highlight, that we shouldn't lose sight of, of whether and why we're using violence in the first place. I'll leave it there. And again, if I may just add a little bit to that, um, it is something I, uh, Christian and I have discussed a lot because I have struggled with this a lot um, about the ethics of who we're focusing on in this research project and about 
what we're presupposing about the nature of international relations and how we should be conducting ourselves. Um, so I don't have any kind of clear answers, but it is definitely something that I have gone round and round and round about. Um, and I think it's something that it's really important that, you know, we keep having flagged up to us because otherwise there is this risk that we look at every, you know, it's the sort of old hammer argument. Every, if you only have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Um, and I think we need to be very cognizant of that and, and we approach, um, how we approach the issues in international politics and how we think about possible resolutions to any issue. Thank you. Um, we have more and more questions and comments coming up. So um, I'm gonna let Jen bring forward her next one. Okay. Um, are there any specific international legal frameworks for the use of drones and attacks on groups or individuals? Are there different rules during the heat of battle as compared to situations like the US's targeted assassination of General uh, Soleimani, the Iranian general? Right, well, I, I have to compliment our attendees on the quality of these questions. Um, uh, and I'll, I, I might have to defer to any lawyers in the audience when I say that I, I believe the answer to the first question is no, that there are no drone specific uh, rules, that, that rather it, it remains the case that armed drone use has to be in accordance with law of armed conflict um, about resorting to force, uh, UN charter rules, uh, the, the first additional protocol of the Geneva Conventions, international humanitarian law. Um, and, and lawyers often will, will, will claim that there's, there's arguably nothing particularly legally interesting about the emergence of armed drones. And, and lawyers will claim that there's a bevy of laws ready and waiting uh, to be uh, applied. Oftentimes though, the, the debate between lawyers is, is which, which body of international law is applicable. Um, not whether or not law is available. And so you often see debates amongst international lawyers and government lawyers and non-government lawyers as to whether a particular drone strike is of a kind to attract the application of international humanitarian law that applies in armed conflict, or whether it's of a kind to attract the application exclusively of international human rights law, uh, which is generally applicable. Um, uh, including outside of, of war circumstances. Right, so so that's, the, that's the best answer I can give on, on, on the first part. On the second part, I wouldn't dream of giving anything resembling a legal opinion on the killing of Qassam Soleimani in January of last year. Partly because there's a great deal about this we don't know. Um, various public statements have been made by um, the US Secretary of State at the time about the background and the circumstances and the reasons for that particular strike. And I am also hesitating to answer the question in a way that would accept the premise that this was an example of assassination at all. Um, this is an example of a good question, which is good precisely because I cannot answer it. But thank you. Thank um, you. I think we have um, another question, Jen. Oh, we have lots of them. Yeah. <laughs> um, has any has any research been done regarding drone pilots versus jet pilots that fire smart missiles? Of course, jet pilots have the risk of being shot down versus drone pilots being relatively safe. If I could uh, briefly speak to this, this is something that that crops up quite a lot um, and discussions, particularly about what's novel about drone warfare and, and drone strikes, um, given that people have been have been shooting from a from planes for, for a while and that's a considerable distance. But for me, and I think Christian um, would agree that the, the difference is not just the extreme distance, um, but it's that matched with the long term surveillance and it's those two things that sort of that interact together that make this quite an interesting case. I don't know that any specific work has been done to compare their experiences. Um, I did look at doing something similar to that for my PhD, but to be honest with you, I was mostly interested in just the experiences of the, the drone crews. Um, so that kind of formed the focus. Um, but I do think, although there are some, some similarities, as, as the questioner has already noted, there is some differences too. So whether you could sort of translate across experience is not necessarily um, the case. Thank you, and um, Jen? 
have a, a comment. Um, I was drafted to be an infantryman in Vietnam, a war I no longer believe to be correct. I was able to participate because I was, it was the game, the reality that I was in. I would willingly kill and accept the reality that the enemy had the right to kill me. And then we have another comment from another participant um, in a question. Uh, when it comes to protecting the troops, do you have a concern that these troops on the ground and at the drone consoles are essentially occupying forces? Are the occupying forces the good guys? And what is the morality of colonial operation, uh, occupation? Right, that's, that's a good one. Um, I, I presented on a, along similar lines a paper at the International Studies Association Convention earlier this month, which was notionally in Las Vegas, but actually in my, in my home. Um, I, I tend not to regard this as a kind of occupation. Um, the, the, the specific circumstance that this question might be alluding to, for example, is where there is sustained presence of armed drones over a period of years. And from time to time, a strike against a suspected terrorist, this kind of constant aerial presence of, of foreign armed drones. And, I, and I'm aware that some scholars have, have described this as a kind of aerial occupation, which is oppressive and discriminatory and, and, and possibly racist and so on and so forth. Um, I suppose I'm, I tend to take, rightly or wrongly, I tend to take a very narrow view of what counts as imperialism and what counts as colonialism. And I guess I take the view that the United States, for example, when it deploys dr drones for years on end in the federally administrated tribal areas of Northwest and Pakistan, uh, is not really occupying that territory in an aerial sense, precisely because aerial occupation is a paradox. Occupation by definition is a ground-based affair and occupation, uh, ethically speaking, comes with responsibilities of good governance and public safety. Um, so I, I, I only say that my answer is, no, I don't think about it that way, simply because I have a narrow view of what counts as colonialism. But I can see that if you take a broader view, there is an interesting discussion to be had about, according to that broad view, the, the imperial um, imaginary uh, that is associated with long-term foreign drone use. But thanks, thanks really for that, for that comment and question. If I may just add a, a little aside to that as well, I think, um, the, it's a really good question and it's really important that we think about that, but I think there is nothing specific to the use of drones in that context or nothing, especially when you're talking about sort of protecting the troops and overwatch, it's nothing specific about drones that makes that more or less colonial. It might be uh, that it is if we're talking about targeted strikes, but I think from the question, I'm just trying to read it in the chat and check what I'm saying, um, that that might be somewhere that that would, that would find a bit of tension. Um, but I think what Christian said, yeah, you'd have to sort of think about it slightly differently if you're talking about sort of overwatch and force protection, maybe. Thank you, um, Jen. I know you've got a few more stacking yeah. up here. Okay. Um, when drone crews whistle blow their moral pain, do academics support their truth telling or simply discuss the issue? Um, example, uh, Dan Hale, who goes on trial for his moral injury. I'll, I'll say a few things, but I'm sure Lindsay will have something more and better to say than I do. This is really good. Um, this speaks very powerfully to something that Lindsay and I have been talking about for years now, about the relationship between research ethics and, and military ethics and the, you know, the, the role of the academic performing an institutional role and the individual who is, who is still wearing the clothes of an academic. And we talk and think a lot about what our responsibilities as researchers are and 
how to go about our research in a way that is ethical and, and, and revealing uh, as we try to, to find our way uh, to, to discover things. Look, th there's, a, there's a few assumptions built into the question, but I want to answer it by saying, I think academics are pro-truth on the whole. And we, in my view at least, we serve society best. We serve everyone best. We serve our research subjects best um, by trying at least to be dispassionate, to try and get at the truth and, and to be listening, seriously listening and carefully paying attention. There are though other colleagues in the academy um, who we might call critical and more activist academics who are perhaps more inclined to be more proactive in, in affording support uh, to, to, to certain um, people who wish to tell a, a certain story about their experience. Um, and, and I respect both those approaches to academic life. Um, yeah, I'm probably reflecting a little bit of my discomfort in, in, again, just how good this question is. And we'll see what Lindsay has to say about this. Thank you. Yes. And as Christian said, this is something we've gone backwards and forwards on. I think it also speaks to the problem of accessing empirical data, which means accessing individuals who want to talk to us, because we can only support what we could. It's, it's really difficult to support um, sort of stories and truth if you haven't collected that data and if you haven't been part of telling that story. As a feminist academic, I've spent a lot of time talking to Christian about um, an ethics of care and what it means to care about um, my, my research subjects. I have had some individuals when I've done research who've come back to me and said, you know, I'm struggling with my memories or my experiences. Can I talk to you about it? And I have to be very mindful that I do have a responsibility to care, but also that I am not a psychologist. I'm not I'm not trained and qualified to provide um, particularly acute mental health support. I can do a certain amount and I can provide signposting, um, but I have, to, I have to be mindful that I am not that, that trained in that way. That's not what my doctorate is in. Um, but I do try when I'm doing my research to always think about where, where power is and who is empowered and how I'm empowering them or how I'm not, how I'm shutting people down, what voices I'm amplifying, because that I think is some of where academics power is, is in what we decide to share and what we decide to say. We always get, collect some raw data and how we use that data is part of our ethical responsibility. Um, so I do think we support truth telling. I think I have more of an emotional bent than maybe Christian is referring to in his his understanding of, of what our roles are. Um, I think that the sort of the feminist methodology that I'm deeply embedded in requires that of me. Um, but yes, it is it's difficult to do around the sort of gatekeepers of university ethics committees. Um, the Ministry of Defence Research Ethics Committee in the UK, which I have a long standing love affair with slightly not, um, uh, about access and about how to speak to people and about what questions we can ask and about how frankly people can talk to us because if they can't talk frankly, they can't tell us the truth. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a truth that would threaten the lives or operational security or anything like that. But I think there's a reluctance on the part of gatekeepers sometimes to let us access that truth. Uh, and that can make life quite difficult. But yes, that is a question I could go on talking about all day. So I'm going to stop now uh, because otherwise I'll get really into the weeds of it. OK, I want to jump in just to bring a question forward from Dr. Camilo Bika, who's who writes Psych psychopaths and sociopaths do not suffer moral injury boot camp and then military moral resilience training attempts to mitigate moral injury viewed as moral weakness to make warriors more effective killers by building moral courage, making warriors less morally sensitive and less susceptible to suffering moral injury, a program of indoctrination conditioning intended to turn warriors into psychopaths and sociopaths. Do you see the warrior preparation process creating individuals who will kill and ultimately all war as ethically problematic. And I think we heard an echo of this in Ivy Kleinbart's question as well. Right, this is a very powerful question to come towards the end of the session. Um, I think you're right, 
at the very end to be raising the possibility that war as a whole and all wars might be morally unacceptable. We should never lose sight of that kind of default pacifist position away from which all just war theorists um, uh, tend to argue. I suppose I'm, I don't take the view based on my experience and what I've read and the people I've talked to, I don't take the view that the purpose of military training is to create or shape people into a state of psychopathy or sociopathy. I don't take the view that that is what is going on, although I, I acknowledge that that is a viewpoint that, that, that this questioner and others uh, ha have put out there. I think military training is, of course, partly in, in as much as it, it supports the combat function, of course, it, it has to be about helping people to cope with doing something which they've been raised to believe since childhood to believe is wrong, which is to kill other human beings. And I think there's a hardening process that military training involves. And we can argue about how protective that is and whether it should be better or, or whether the solution is rather to, to be putting people in the position to kill others less frequently. I think that's an important conversation to be to be had. But I, I'm just not, I just don't agree with the view that, that this is a kind of deliberate exercise to induce psychopathy. I, I'm not convinced that that's not, that I'm not convinced that that's what's going on. Thank you. And I do recognize that we are at the end of the time. So I want to thank our panelists, um, Dr. Anna Mark and Dr. Clark, and also all of these really strong, thoughtful, engaged questions. We'll save the chat, anything that we didn't get to. And I apologize if we didn't get to your question or your comment. We'll make sure that the two researchers have those questions. I know that they wanted to engage with us and also um, use what we're able to provide them as, as a basis for continuing their work and continuing the conversation. So again, I wanna thank everyone who attended and also thank Dr. Annamark and Dr. Clark and um, encourage them to stay in touch with us at the Moral Entry Project so that we can continue the dialogue because there was a lot of important thoughts offered here. Um, I also encourage everybody who attended to read um, Eric Liddick's article on being a lawyer in the midst of making decisions about drone strikes and his moral injury, and just to consider the perspectives of service members on the ground having to, and also in the drone chair, thinking through these questions, as well as activists who are actively fighting to stop drone warfare. And I did see a lot of um, activist thoughts here, as well as encouragement to take active roles in addressing these issues. So thank you everyone. And we will now close the session and I hope everyone continues the conversation beyond this session. We certainly will be deciding about future programming and wanting to continue this conversation. So thank you again. <laughs>